Hello guys, welcome back to our third online coaching seminar. Um, I just want to thank you all so much because some really some common names there from last night. Really want to thank you all for the kind words online. Um, it looks like that we're heading the right direction with the with the stuff that we're showing. So also on top of that, if anything that you feel that we do need to cover that you'd like to have covered, feel free to let me know online and we'll um, we'll see if we can get it covered before before Sunday evening. Um, tonight, I'd like to have two great speakers following on from last night, Carol Cabride, National Cup champion with senior women, Lester. Um, and he's going to talk about five out offense. And Aaron O'Connell, who is coaching me here and has been coaching since 1986, but is also um, on the sports performance pathway and has a master's in sports psychology from WIT and is also current studying applied sports coaching in UL. So I'm absolutely thrilled to have two great guests on again tonight and we look forward to seeing them. As always, keep yourselves on mute um, and if you have any questions you'd like to do to ask, feel free to post them in, in, um, in our questions area and I will get to as many as we possibly can. So um, Enjoy. Hopefully you've enjoyed last couple nights and enjoy tonight also. So I pass you guys over to uh, Carl Schildbride. All right. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, so. I'm going to talk about um, five out offense, um, kind of um, what it is, who would run it, um, you know, what kind of teams, why they would run it, um, what are some of the challenges, and, and how you can kind of implement it. Um, so I don't like to think of it as a, a an offense per se. Um, it, it's like a I like to see it as a kind of a structure. It was initially, I, I believe, put together by a, a guy called Rick Torbett, and it's basically a structure, starting kind of like it says in the tent, starting five out made up of a bunch of different layers and, and rules and actions and they're all based around um, players being able to kind of read the action of their teammate and defender and uh, react accordingly. Um, I started running this in 2014. Um, I was assistant coach to Meg Coleman with the under 16 Irish team and we decided we put in this uh, five out read and react offense and we kind of went, I went researching and looking for literature and videos online and it was actually really, really hard to come by. There, there wasn't a lot around then. Um, whereas now, if you go online now, there's just so much information out there. It's amazing. Um, you'll spend days and weeks on end um, looking at literature and diagrams and um, and kind of flowcharts of how to implement it and what's involved. And there's a bunch of videos and, and there's so much stuff out there. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to, um, to, to, to look it up. And you don't need to take uh, everything from it. So... What I like to do is to take little parts that, that work for for my teams and implement the bits that, that work. And that can be different with different teams and different years. Um, but the, the, the overall kind of principle is the same on um, how to make a read, how to make a decision, and um, uh, how to react to, to defenders and teammates. Um, so who should run it? Um, it doesn't really matter, right? Everyone and anyone can run it. It can be, you can have um, a, a team of lightning quick guards, you can have a bunch of spot-up shooters, you can um, you can run it with really dominant forwards. Um, and, you know, in, in, in this year and years gone past, kind of at the start of the season, when I kind of explain what we'd be doing, I'll have different players that play inside come to me and go, you know, where, where, um, where am I going to look to get the ball? Um, and it's, you know, kind of, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Although you start five out, uh, you never finish five out. And if you're a forward, what, what you know, I would always kind of say to them is, well, what better than getting the ball in the block one on one with with great spacing around you the whole time? Um, so you can. It doesn't really matter what kind of team you have. Um, you can again. You don't need to incorporate absolutely all of it. You pick the parts that are going to work for you, and and you you kind of work from there. Um, why would teams run it? It varies from underage to senior. With underage, I find it so important that to teach players how to play before you teach them plays. It 
Uh, now, obviously, look, every coach has their own philosophy and, and the way they do things, but it breaks my heart when it happens in my own club and 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 around Dublin, and I've seen it around in different counties around Ireland, seeing go through under twelve game and seeing kids trying to trying to set ball screens, but not, you know, having been shown how and um, just being so static and um, and and running to the corner because this is what the play says and going to set this screen because this is what the play says and and, and never actually making um decisions and and making reads. Um and so this is what this is what the offense does. It teaches them great spacing. Um so it makes sure that the the the, the lane is it's almost always clear and because you get great spacing it, it allows them to develop this really attacking mindset that um that you know seeing lanes when they open up and always wanting to get the ball in the key because there's always space to 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 attack. Um and that it teaches them to to kind of look for advantages the whole time and not just what's the next action in the play in the set that we're running um you know they're going what's my defender doing what's my teammate doing what's the help defender doing uh what are my options from it um and most importantly i i have a phrase i always use and it's no robots and i have it printed on my coaching board and uh i always tell teams that i coach that i can take pretty much anyone off a gaelic field outside and within 10 minutes, explain to them what a screen is and tell them to go to the screen here and now go stand in the corner. Now go to the screen there and now run to the other side. Right? But what I can teach them is how to make those reads and how to make those decisions and how to understand what the defense is doing and how to understand what my options are going to be after my teammate makes this cut or what uh, my teammate's options are going to be if I make this cut and to, to, to not be robots, that anyone can be a robot and anyone can, can just go through the motions of of this is what I do next, this is what I do next. But it's uh, uh, what separates the, 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 the great players from everyone else is being able to, to make those reads. At senior level, it's a little different. Um, one of the big advantages is that um, because there's no, um, you know, you play five out, you're going to have, it's going to look different almost every time down the floor, right? So it gives the players autonomy um, and it lets them decide what happens next. Um, it, it means that they're they're generally not afraid to make mistakes, right? It means that if they do make mistakes, well, they're owning them because they've decided what happens in the offense. It's not what the coach has decided, and it's a little bit of organized chaos. So if you're if you're guarding a team that are, are constantly moving and constantly cutting and, and never standing still, uh, it becomes uh, difficult. Firstly, um, physically, but also secondly, mentally on. Um, where the help is coming from, and who's rotation, who's rotating down, and and what's happening on switches, and it makes life a little more difficult for the defense. From one of the things we really learned at, at international level, at Europeans, and also then Super League, is scouting. Um, because we don't know, I don't know essentially what's if we run, uh, we call it circle. If we run five out, I don't necessarily know what's going to happen in any given possession. So, you know, no matter how well a team has scouted us, they don't know either. Um, and again, then it gives you versatility. So um, whether you're playing, it'll work against man. You can play it against zone. Uh, you, as I said, you, if you've got a if you've got a, a big kind of forward dominated team, you can play that no problem. If you've got a, uh, you know, I've done it with a team of slashing guards. I've done it with a team where this year where we've got a bunch of spot up shooters, um, and it gives you great versatility and um, great um, great flexibility in, in in what you want to play and and, and when you um, when you want to play it. Um, what are the challenges? So I, I heard uh, Niall last night talked about, um, you know, uh, being an autocratic coach. Uh, and I know on, on Paul's um, podcast during the week, he talked about uh, early on in his career being autocratic and wanting to be in charge and, and uh, of kind of every um, every uh, every step and, and every, um, every set that they run. You have to be willing as a coach to be able to embrace the chaos that... Um, Again, you don't know what you're going to get play to play. Sometimes it's going to be sometimes it's going to be magic and, and look beautiful. And other times you're going to turn the ball over when there's miscommunication. They're going to run in a layup down the other end, and you have to be okay with that. Um, you have to um, you have to understand that the the good uh, what the good should outweigh the bad. Um, it takes a lot of repetition. It's not something that you can just put in two training sessions and everybody's got it. Um, you have to do it over and over and over because the players. Have to be able to to although they're making reads and making these decisions, they have to be able to make decisions without even thinking about it. That it needs to become second nature. 
Um, again, we talked about bad possessions. It's going to be times um, where two people cut up to the same spot at the same time. They bump into each other or uh, the player rotating goes back to or but the player with the ball thinks they're going to pop out and we throw the ball off the wall. Um, these things can happen. Uh, if you've got a dominant, you know, one dominant score that you want to go to the whole time, it's not ideal. Again, you can uh, work actions into it um, where you get that player the ball in positions you want. Um, and then turnovers, uh, because there's so much movement and there's so many, um, there's so many reads on each, uh, uh, you know, on each given play that you're going to turn the ball over more than if I know exactly what's going to happen. Um, you know, when the pass goes to the wing, I know exactly what's going to happen on the other side. When we set the screen, I know exactly what's going to happen. There's a little bit of the unknown there. Um, how you implement it? Um, you've got rules uh, and actions and reads and. You don't, the, the joy, especially for underage, that you don't need to implement it and put it all in at once. You put it in in layers um, and you can do it gradually and, and slowly over time. And so you can do from the very basics that I'm sure everyone here has done, you know, five out and you pass to the wing and you cut through. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you teach actions. And again, like we talked about, what happens if that player cuts through? What do I do next? Um, what, what am I, what's my defender doing? What's my read off that? If my defender turns their head, where am I going? If they, um, if they help up too high, what am I doing? Some of the, and each coach is going to have different rules for different teams. Um, you can have as few or, or, or as many as, as you want. Um, some of the, some of the, the basics, and again, like the rules I have for Super League will be very different to the rules I have underage and different to international. It all depends on the, the makeup of the team you've got. But some of the, the, the really simple ones that, that we use is that every time you make a pass, you must never stand still. At no point should anyone be standing still in, in the offense. If you're going to make a cut, you have to occupy one and a half defenders. So if you're going to make a cut, you have to cut like your life depends on it. You have to cut so hard that you've completely occupied your defender and someone in help has had to at least look at you or tag you or step in uh, to, to, to stop you getting the ball. Every time you make a cut, you have to look to back pick your way out. So a lot of the time, what, what I see when people run five out is they make a pass and make a cut out the other side, make a pass, make a cut out the other side, and it becomes a little bit repetitive and monotonous. Um, so what we want to do is you look to on the way out, instead of just filling to the next spot, I look around and I, and I, and I, and I read the defense to see, has, has the defender got their head turned? Can I back pick my forward to roll them into the lane? Um, can I um, can I can I back pick the point guard to get them to 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 get them down the line? Uh, you know, it doesn't. Ha they don't have to do it every time, but they have to look at it. Um, when we're filling, um, so ball is going to the wing. We're filling from the weak side. The two really really simple reads that I put in straight away with, with at every level. If the defender has their weight anywhere towards the three point line, you must go back door. If the defender is anywhere below the free throw line, you must curl to the lane. Um, from the weak side then if you see the back of someone's head you have to make a cut because if you can see the back of your defender's head on the weak side they can't see you um, uh, so again just a couple of simple rules that you can put in the past you can add them in and they can become more complicated as you go and, and, and you can kind of add and, and, and tweak for whatever works with, with the teams that you're, you're coaching some of the more um, kind of important rules and slightly more difficult ones as what happens on dribble penetration and again, everyone's going to have um, different rules. There's a bunch of stuff online. You take what you want that works for you and, uh, and you implement it. So, for example, with us, anytime the ball goes middle, everyone rotates one spot in the direction the ball goes. So if the ball is, if we're in five out and the ball's at the top of the key and we penetrate down the lane, that's gone middle. The corner person is along the baseline. The wing slides to the corner. Uh, anytime you go baseline, we want baseline drip. So we got to make sure there's someone in the weak side corner and the next weak side guard dives down the line. Um, if we drive from the wing to the sideline, uh, again, sometimes, uh, especially underage, you would just have everyone rotate one spot. At senior level, I want them lifting because we look for we look to hit the player um, lifting with a pitch pass. And it also means that we take um, the help defender out of the play. If you dribble at someone, really, really important. Um, if you dribble at someone, they have to do something. Right, they go back door, they take a handoff, but they can't stay still and they make a read. Right, if they're again that player um, who doesn't have the ball, if the defenders their weight is towards the three point line, they're going back door. Um, ball screens and handoff and handoffs. So, 
I use a lot of ball screens and a lot of handoffs, and you can do it in five out. Uh, and we treat them all as dribble penetration. Unless someone has used that screen or taken that handoff, everybody reacts as if the ball um, is is in the lane. Um, ideally, what I'd want to do um, to kind of demonstrate all this is be on the floor and have a bunch of players and walk everyone through it. But because we don't have that, um, because we're all stuck in our in our houses, um, I've uploaded a couple of videos, kind of showing real life examples from. Um, Irish teams are Super League teams that have coached in the past. So if you bear with me, I'm just going to share some video here. So the, I'm going to share five different videos, right? One of them is movement off a pass. Second is making reads. Um, the third is how you use it against the zone. And then the last two are the most important. Uh, number four is cutting after you hit a cutter. And five is movement off the dribble. So we'll start with uh, movement off the pass here first. Paul, can you see this? Paul, can you see that video? Yeah, movement of a pass. Okay, perfect. So unfortunately, uh, due to some technology restraints, I can't uh, kind of rewind and forward on this. I'm just going to have to kind of play it through, and I'll pause in a couple of different spots to, to talk about what's going on. <laughs> So, real simple first off is if you make a pass and make a cut. As simple as it can get. You make a pass, the line opens up, and, and, you, and you hit that gap. Right, weak side cut. So, the first couple we looked at is ball side, to, to where, you, where we find a lot of. Um, a lot of joy is making weak side cuts. And again, that's where you're reading your defender. Are they towards, the, have they got their weight leaning towards the three-point line? Are they below the free throw line? And what read am I making from? Uh... Right, we got second cutter. We see the defender below the free throw line. Hazel curls in the lane. We got a line. Same thing. Weak side defenders below. The free throw line. If we look here. Um, Again, we're making reads the whole time. So at the back of the, the back of the defense here, we have Aaron McClure has completely turned her head and lost Krista. She just flashed. So again, Becca has curled off the screen here. As we get in the lane, we see the weak side defenders head along the baseline. This one here, at this point, all three defenders have their head turned. Right? And when I play this now, we have an option of, again, they're all over playing, they all have their head turned, and we end up getting three players open on the, on the same. Um, and so, again, just some really, really simple, uh, simple examples of make a pass, make a cut. Uh, on, on the strong side, from the weak side, you make a read, what's my defender doing, and react accordingly. Um, Next one I'm going to show is again making those reads, um, and I've shown a couple of different examples of making a read uh, when you have the ball, and making a read when when you don't have the ball. So right here, Ella's overplayed, feels the contact, rolls off the back, and we go back door. Same thing. Emma, they tried to cut her off at the high post. Overplayed goes back door, and again you can do that. And it provides the backdoor cuts are, are you'll get them all the time off passes and off dribbles. Again, because you've got such good spacing. Again, every time it stops here, you can see the defender's head turned, and they've made a pass. So if you see, like we talked about, if you see the back of a defender's head, you have to make a cut. So you can see Sinead Deegan has turned her head and we get in behind the baseline. 
Same thing. Defender reaches, turns her head. Ash makes a cut straight down the line. Here, Ellis Player completely turns her head to go help the ball. Simple cut. We get an open look. Right, Mimi drives. We see Janice Player completely turn her head, makes a cut, easy layup. So anytime you see a defender's head, you must make a cut. Next thing we look for, and again, this is all down to the kind of team you had, the type of team you have. So we had a we had an excellent three point shooting team this year, and so we set a lot of flare screens. We wanted to reverse the ball and, and, and flare shooters open on the weak side. So anytime, if you're like we talked about setting back picks on your way out, if you see a help defender in, you're going to set a flare screen and, and look to set a shooter up on the weak side. So on this one here, Ash goes to make a cut, right? Realizes Beck has turned the corner and immediately turns the cut into a flare screen. Now, we don't end up hitting her, but again, it's a reach. She She's gone from setting that screen into setting a flare screen. Again, we have Rebecca Harris flare screen on the weak side, and we get open looks. And it's the kind of thing that they don't have to set those screens. You know, they can just cut out to the other side and fill their next spot and be a robot and just go through the motions but instead we're, we're making reads and, and we're getting somebody open uh, somebody open same idea Crystal sets the player screen, we got ball reversal and we get an open look so uh, again that's making reads off the ball um, one of the, the again the, the, the great things about playing 5 out is that you've got so much spacing so if you have a guard that is good at getting downhill and getting in the lane it's the perfect opportunity for them uh, and they, they just need to make a read of when to attack and when not. So if we look at Adela here, uh, we're playing five out. There's a big old lane straight to the back. Again, she sees that lane, attacks it, and gets gets an open look. Again, we see open lane, no help because everyone's on the three-point line. Open look. Same thing. We freeze it again. No help because everyone's on the three-point line. Open look. Right, again, if you look at, um, at Slagas here, the, the girl from Carlo led the league in, in, um, in blocks, unbelievable player, brilliant defender. We take her out of the play here with some movement because Kira rotates to the, we'll see here when I hit play, Kira rotates to the top of the key. Slagas has to go with her, which opens up a lane for Adela to get to the basket. And again, if you have those type of players, it's, it's, it's an easy way of getting... Um, Getting, getting kind of open layups a lot of the time. Uh, so, again, that's against man. You can play it against zone, no problem. Um, by the way, I, I've muted the, the sound in all these videos so that you can actually hear me. Um, you can play it against zone. Um, you can start, I always start, well, mostly start at five out, um, but it, it will end, it doesn't need to end in five out. It will almost always end in four out because we want to hit the high post the whole time. And when you start with that spacing, there's big holes um, around the free trial line and the key that, that we try to exploit. So playing against the zone, right, we see all the defenders have their head turned. Ash makes that cut, wide open look. Right, against zone here again. A couple of things happen here, right? This is a, a two-three zone. Because Adela has made a cut, right, Adela has, has come into the key and has contacted Casey. Casey's worried about Adela. Amy's worried about Mimi making a cut. And Chris is wide open. Again, we constantly look to hit the high post. We can set ball screens. There's, there's no set structure. But once we hit the high post now, that cues Adela to make a cut. Right? Because once the ball's in the lane, we count as dribble penetration. So we must move along the baseline. Same thing. Ball's in the air. Ella moves. Circle movement. And we get an open look. Carl, just a quick one there, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, just something that's come in there. Um, can you identify numbers and colours? Because some people aren't aware of who the, who the players are. Okay. Uh, my problem is every time I pause it, I'm muting, or every time I hit play, I'm muting myself. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best there. Um, so on this one here, okay, this was in slow motion. We have... This, this play takes 11 seconds and we get six different players coming through. Sorry, I muted myself. Again, the six players coming through the key within these 11, have a foot in the key within these 11 seconds. 
And again, it just makes life really difficult for the people. So we end up turning it over. And again, like you talked about, you're going to have to live with those kind of turnovers. But we got a great look from it. And had it, had it been a better pass, we, we get a, a, an open layup. Um, again, here we start five out. There's a big hole in the middle of the defense. And you'll see uh, Krista on the right side here is just going to slip into, uh, into the hole. And comes wide open. So on this one, we've set a ball screen against the one three one here. Okay. So if you look at um Jasmine Walker here, uh, the 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 back of the one three one, she's moving with the ball. And because after Krista sets this screen, she flares, now it means that the weak side wing has taken her. When she does, it means the lift around the weak side is wide open. Again, apologies, I keep muting myself here. Um so again. There's there's um, a bunch of different ways you can play it. So you can do play it against man, play it against zone, um, and it's again a little. It's going to look a little different every time. Um, the next one is probably the the one where I've gotten the most benefit, um, and, and it's cutting after you hit a cutter. Right, we call it cutting off the cutter because we want to cut right off the off the shoulder. We're not looking for handoffs, but every time we make a pass, especially uh, underage, that, that one of the things that we teach is that you look at your defender's head. It's only natural if, you, if I'm guarding the ball and my defender's pass the ball, I look around to see where the ball's gone. Right? Once the defender's turned ahead, ideally we want to cut opposite. Worst case scenario, we may, we just make a cut. Um, and again, I'm gonna kind of I let this play through and, and just talk through it. But every time someone makes a pass, the video is gonna freeze for a second. We'll see the defender's head turned and we'll see the cut they make and the open up they get from it. And you're probably gonna see a bunch of mislines too. Right, so we hit the cutter. If you look at Danielle O'Leary's head here, completely turned around. Dave makes a wide open cut. Danielle doesn't even see her until she has the ball again. Again, we hit the cutter. Defender in the corner has turned her head, and we get a wide open look. Right, again, ball side defender turns their head, open look through the lane, and it's it's so simple. It's not, it's it's not, um, it's not. You know, you don't need to have done. Um, you know, coaching courses and 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 um, you don't need to be, a, you know, an NBA level coach. You make a pass, your defender turns your head, you make a cut, you're going to get a good look. Um, it's just a question of in training, can you can you do that over and over and over again so that it becomes second nature and they don't have to think about it. You make a cut, defender turns their head, we get an open look from a weak side cutter. Right, again, we see Kayla Flaherty turn her head, Dead wide open, and we got a layup because of it. Same thing. Casey turns her head, Chris through the lane, and we get we get a wide open look. And, and and it's it's just something so simple. Again, we we, we treat um, hidden cutters the same way. So if you have um, post players and you want to go inside, it's the same the same rule. If you make a post entry or if you hit someone in the key, you must make a cut. So it doesn't need to be a cutter. You can post someone up, and once you do, again. If you're guarding the player that's made that pass, you're going to turn your head, right? So automatically, we want that player making that next cut. Right, so we reverse the ball. Both defenders turn their head. We get a wide open look. Right, again, so Kathy's in the corner here. We see her again, completely lose the player. Uh, open look again, just making a pass, making a cut, something so simple. Right, we see Adela here. It takes a time, but eventually Karen turns her head and we get a wide open look. Um, and it's again, it's not something um, special or magical. It's having uh, the repetition, uh, having done it over and over again in training and having the players to have the discipline to everything that make that pass, they have to do something. You cannot stand still. Um, so if you hit a cutter, they're going to turn their head and can you make the, the defender pay for it. Last video. Um, and it's about what happens off dribble penetration. And this will vary coach to coach and it'll vary on, on team to team of what and what you want to do. And again, some of the rules that I talked about earlier, uh, anytime the ball goes middle, we all rotate one spot, which means that I have to have a cutter along the baseline and I have to have someone fade to the corner. Uh, if we use a handoff or a ball screen, we treat that as dribble penetration and everyone must rotate. Um, again, rotate one spot. Uh, I'll just show you some examples here.
So one of the things that uh, you'll get a lot of is back to our cuts, particularly dribble at. So what we'll we'll there's a three or four of them here where we'll stack two players at the top of the key, which means that whatever side we attack now, we've isolated one defender. And naturally, if someone's dribbling at you as a defender, you're going to turn your head to the ball. And so we want people in back door the whole time. The same thing. We attack the weak side defender, head turned. We get a back door layout. Same thing. Dribble at, head turned, back door, open layout. Dribble at, head turned right in behind. Help comes, make the next pass, and we get a wide open look. Right, and again, it's all, it all comes from dribbling at that isolated defender and, and putting them in a position that do they ignore the ball or do they turn their head and we make them pay for it. Same thing, dribbling at here. Uh, so this set here, there's an option that either you take, a, when we run it, you've got an option of taking a handoff or going back door. We see here, <coughs> a couple of plays previous, we've taken the handoff. If they look to overplay Ash here, number eight, she immediately just goes and gets a layup. Same thing, we see Casey leaning. Once once she leans towards the three-point line, Chris has gone back door, and we get a line. Same set here, we just showed a minute ago. We had just taken a handoff over and over. Uh, in the corner here, Dana tried to tried to um, cheat a little bit. Adela got her leaning, and we get her back door immediately. Right, ball screens and handoffs. Um, Again, we want to make sure we want to we want we have to when we use the screen, we must take at least at least two dribbles because if we take two dribbles, we now engage both sides of the floor. So we want to make sure at all times when we use a handoff or we use a ball screen that we have action on both sides. So if something has happened on the strong side, we want to uh, if if there's a third player, we want to lift her on the weak side. It'll depend on on the makeup of your team. So do you want to put one player over there and an isolated defender and try and beat them back door? Do you um, do you have a shooter coming off a stagger screen? Do you just use circle movements and you have someone rotating along the baseline and a shooter fading to the corner? It all depends on the makeup of your team and, and how you want to do it. <laughs> Excuse me. But we want to make sure we're taking two dribbles and that we got action both sides. So at this time on the weak side, we set a flare screen. So we took a second dribble, health defender was in. Instead of rotating, Jenna set a great flare screen, and we see Krista get an open look here. And then we've got action on both sides. We've got a flare screen on the weak side, and we get a wide open look. Hand off into a ball screen. We've got a flare screen on the weak side. Because Hannah rolls, we've got a lifter wide open, then strong side. And again, it means because we have action both sides, everyone is constantly moving, and it means that it just becomes far more difficult uh, as a health defender knowing who I'm picking up, who's my rotation, what, who's tagging the roller, uh, what's happening if we switch, what happens if we hedge, uh, and it just makes life a little more difficult for them. Again, so we've got a stagger screen this time, and we got an open look. This is an end of the clock situation. Same thing here. This time we got one player on the weak side. And so when we get to here, Amy Murphy's in, in a position now that Ash has turned the corner and we're trying to get downhill. And naturally, you want to stop the ball, right? So it, or she's got a foot in the key, but we got a shooter on the three-point line. And it means that we get an open look because of it. Same thing, we got a stagger on the weak side. And we got a wide open look. <laughs> because we have action on both sides of the floor. And we've engaged. So we talked earlier about occupying one and a half defenders. So Adela has made a cut here. She's occupied her defender, Simone, and a health defender, Shannon Brady. So as Ash comes off the screen on the, the ball screen on the strong side, we reverse it and Becca's wide open because Shannon got caught up bumping. Uh, bumping. Same thing. So now Ella rolls because she rolls hard. We didn't get action on the weak side there, but because she rolled hard, ball side tagged in, lifter was wide open. This time they tried to hard hedge the screen, and because Ella rolls now, uh, we see Ella here down, in, in, down the lane. Circa has to tag in, and because of that, we're wide open in the corner.
Right? And so again, we call it circle. I call it circle movement. That every time we ball to the floor, someone has to rotate. And so again, we want to get in the key. And so if we look here on the on the weak side here on the right hand side, we see Jay Daly about to try and make a cut. Realize it's not a good idea. Get back out to the three point line. And when the ball gets on the is put on the floor, it's faced to the corner, and we get an open look from it. And we get an open look all because we all because we moved on the weak side and we had some action. So we see the help all the way in here now. Long close out, open look. Again, in the key, circle moves along the baseline. This is when we get all the time uh, and we get an open look. Again, we see the defender's head turned. Cutter, open look. Right, and it goes to make a cut, stops when it's not there. But recognizes any time we hit a cutter in the lane, it counts as dribble penetration. She finishes her cut and we get an open look. Again, circle movement. We had a wide open look along the baseline. Chris to get straight to the basket. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So one of the things we we want to make sure when the ball goes baseline that we have someone feeling the corner. This wasn't a great example of it here. We had no one uh, in the corner, but as everyone as the defense rotate down, it means the weak side wing will almost always have a lane to the basket. We want to make sure if the ball goes baseline that we have a we have a weak side corner which. I'm good, Carl. I'm muting myself. I'm muting myself. We got a uh, good mute movement off the ball. We got a, a flare screen here as we reversed it. So we went from one side of the floor to the other. We reversed the ball. Now Adela comes back, and because she goes middle, we see we see Kira along the baseline. Sagas has to pick her up, and I let Adela Adela get to the basket. And I look, uh, that's just some examples of um, some examples of kind of how you would use it in real life. Everyone is going to have um, their own way of doing it. Everyone's going to have their own rules, their, the, what they're looking for. Again, if you, you have a team of shooters, maybe you want to set a bunch of flare screens. If you if you slash to the basket well, maybe you look at weak side cutters slashing down the lane. If you've got a big team, maybe you, <clears throat> on every ball screen or handoff, you're looking for them more often so you can roll it forward inside and play inside out. And, it just gives you the, the, the flexibility to play however you want at senior level, but most importantly, underage, it teaches players how to be basketball players and not be robots, how to make a decision and a read, what's my defender doing, what's my teammate doing, uh, and how do I react to it accordingly. Uh, and that's it, that's it. Thanks a million, Carl. That was um, very, uh, very informative. Um, we've got one question in, but I'll ask a bunch of questions after that, if that's okay, Carl. Um, yeah. So, does the success of this offense depend on basketball IQ? Um, yes and no, right? So, so what you'll, if you notice that there was a couple of players that came up in those clips over and over again. Um, so, uh, cutting off the cutter, uh, Jay Daly does, does it better than anyone I've ever coached. Adam Kluski does a great job of moving off the ball. Um, so, it, 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 it suits a high IQ team better. But, I mean, again, it, from the very from the, the, the very simple part of it, doesn't, you don't need to be that high, high IQ to know that your, your rule is if you hit a cutter, you reach the defender's head and you cut the other way. Um, and so, you can, you can kind of build intelligence from from an underage level of, of just putting it in layer by layer you don't need you don't need to do it all at once so you can just work on um again what happens uh when i'm when i'm rotating okay what do i do if my defenders up what do they do if my defenders down uh, uh you know what do i do if i make a pass uh, and, and kind of build it up gradually like that all right um so I'll, if you don't mind I'll, I'll ask a bunch of questions i guess you know just because we run some similar actions and, and things like that so um, just a couple of quick things. Um, in transition, are you guys running the spots, or are you allowing anybody to get to different positions? Do you have a rim runner? Do you go, do you transition into five out, or do you transition into a four out one in, then pop the fifth person out? Um, so, what are your guidelines um, in in transition? It, it all depends on the team. Um, so. Super League this year, for example, again, we shot the ball really well. Um, and so something I got from 
Tommy Amani during the year, it, Tommy loves looping. And so we want the ball out over the top to whoever's gone first. We want someone looping from the weak side and we want to, and we want a second cutter because we want to contract the defense. And if we have two people going through the lane, the defense will almost always be in the lane and we're looking to trail into trees and, and, and looking again. So when they come out the other side, looking to set flare screens and make skip passes um, and step into trees, um, again, with um, with the Irish in the 16 team a couple of years ago, we didn't have great three-point shooters, but we slashed to the basket really well. So again, we want the ball out over the top as quick as possible. I don't care who makes the cut. We want whoever's there first goes. Right? We're looking for a second cutter and a third cutter, and we want to just constantly put the defense under pressure uh, in, in in having to having to guard cutters. I haven't had um, I haven't I haven't had a real kind of dominant scoring. I haven't had many teams with a real dominance going forward, so we don't necessarily rim run and, and look to see and post up that way. Um, what we want to do is get in the lane, because if we get in the lane, defense is going to contract, and now we're looking to make to make a read off that. Very good, very good. I had a similar question. One just come in there from Paul Bigotche. Um If you were defending your offense, what are the guidelines you'd give to your defenders? So... Uh, when when one of the one of the teams that uh, Mark Ingle does a great job uh, at, at guarding us. Every time we play DCU, we really struggle because one of the the one of the areas you can kind of you can slow it down is by being super physical and by bumping every cutter and making everyone go back door the whole time. Um, being up and passing lanes and and it, it kind of it can take teams out of their out of their kind of flow and rhythm and the ball will get stuck a little bit. Um, so. It's now look if you've got a really physical team who can who can handle that then um, you know then great or if you've got a, a team that posts up well that you know you can you can set screens and roll people inside off that um, but again it's something DCU do a really good job at and again be super aggressive in in past the lanes and and, and bumping um, bumping cutters every single opportunity they get. Very good, very good. Quick one. Obviously, you know, we've, we're moving into this more dynamic, holistic, positionless offense type of, um, of, of basketball globally. Um, what do you encourage your forwards to do in a three-point line? Do you, have they, got, have they got the green light to put the ball on the floor? Have they got a green light to be, or, or have they automatically they must reverse the ball screen? Or, or what do you do? What, what's... What encouragement do you give for your forwards to partake in an offense like this? So what, what, what I kind of tell everyone, everyone has the green light all the time, no matter what, um, to, 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 to make the right decision and make the right read at, at, that, at that time. If um, Again, I was at Super League level, we had most, almost all of our forwards could shoot to three and, and had that range. Um, but what we want to, to do, what we would generally say is, that, look, if you you know you, you if you're if you're feeling yourself and your your center pulls up for a tree in transition that climbs off the side of the board, I don't care as long as it might go for it at the other end, right? I, I go get us the possession back. Um, uh, you know what what we want is them to to have, and again, it takes repetition, 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 knowing what I'm doing in this scenario. So if um if 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 a team is switching screens the whole time, right? So my forward catches it maybe in secondary transition, they've trailed in, they catch it at the top of the key. Maybe automatically now they look to they've got a point guard on the other side, they look for a dribble handoff because we know that they're switching everything. Now we look to go inside and it's a way that the forward will get the ball inside. Um if our forward has uh, an, a speed or, or, or a quickness advantage. Maybe they, they make a skip pass and they make a weak side cut through the lane because now, now, they've, put, now they've got a, a, a defender on their back with, again, four shooters spotted up around them. So I, I give them the, the freedom and the ability to, to make their own decisions. Sometimes, uh, you know, you're, 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 it's not the decision you want them to make. Um, but again, you have to be able to embrace that chaos and live, that, live with the fact that you know, sometimes um, it isn't going to work out, but there's often times where, uh, you know, in a game you're going, oh, what are you shooting that for? And all of a sudden goes in. Or you go, I can't believe you missed that cutter, but actually they've seen the second cutter coming and they've hit them. And, and you want to give them the, the, the freedom to, to not be a robot and be a basketball player and make those decisions themselves. Okay, so last question. So you, we've, everybody has their own style. Some people are schemers, you know, they run sets all the time. Some people are a bit more automatics as opposed to being not deliberate with schemes. One of the phrases we use with our teams in terms of this is 
the old Peter Parker phrase in Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. This is a very autonomy type of offense. How do you, what do you, what kind of guidelines do you give that's a bad shot, a good shot, and when do you take away the autonomy from them in this sort of offense? So uh, we wouldn't run this, I don't run this all game. Um, so there has been years in the past where we played five out, read and react the whole time, and we barely run sets. Um, we do run some sets, and we will, we will, a lot of the time, we'll, our sets will be kind of short, so we'll have actions. So we'll start, we'll have an action on one side, we notice action on the weak side, and we make decisions off that. Uh, as in, like, we'll have a set action on this side, a set action on the weak side, and, and whatever happens now, we're making decisions off that. Um, the, um, the, what's the good shot? If you're on balance and you're in rhythm and you're open, shoot the ball. Um, you know, if you're, if you're feeling good about it. Sometimes, I, I generally don't mind, sometimes they want to, they want to come down and shoot from six feet outside the three point line because they're feeling themselves. I'm okay with it. If it misses, you got to go get me one back. Um, but if it goes in, you know, you're celebrating on the sideline and you look like you're a great coach and you know what you're doing. And this, yeah. this has been the game plan the whole time. Um, but again, I want to give them the, the freedom to, to make those decisions and you kind of learn over time. And in training, if um, you don't call it a bad decision, right? But you might stop it and say, look, we made that read, but here's what would have happened had we waited. Right, and so sometimes what you find is that you're stopping them training for when they do things wrong, right? And so I make a, a really deliberate point in every single video session every week that we have that I, I put in all of the good reads and all of the good cuts and all of the good movement that we made to show that look, I don't have time to stop training every time we do something well because you know we should be doing so well most of the time. But to show that look in the game, I recognise you've done a great job here, um, and, and hopefully, again now someone has seen that. You know, uh, we, I've highlighted that we've made this pass and we've made this cut, and here's what happened. And now, next time down, we go, well, let's look for that again. And it's in the back of their head. Perfect. Um, right, Carl, absolutely fantastic. Um, great, great clips again to show us what you guys do. Um, hopefully, it hasn't given away too much next year, but uh, you know, it was basically all about the see it. We we the same phrase, see a head, see a shoulder, and that's how we basically guide our, our stuff like that. So. Um, so, great job. We move on. There's no more real questions that come in. Excuse me. Um, so, I'll take you off presenter and I'll move on to Aaron O'Connor. Aaron, you good? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Thanks. All right. Take it away, Aaron. Cool. Um, I'm. Um... Sorry, any uh, thanks to uh, Paul and everybody for uh, allowing me to uh, to give, speak to you tonight. Uh, I hope you're all safe and well at home. Um, I hope um, this um, presentation is going to be uh, helpful to you. Um, so this evening, I'm going to talk about um, mindfulness in sport. I'm going to provide you with a what I would term a helicopter view of it, um, looking at mindfulness in general and um, its uh, uses and benefits to both players and coaches and then some of the activities I use with my teams and with people that I work with outside of basketball. So I'm going to just um, share the, the screen here now. Is that okay Paul? Can you see it? Yeah I can see that yeah so yeah. you're on mindfulness and sport. Yes excellent thanks. So mindfulness it, it has its origins in um, uh, Buddhism uh, hundreds of years ago, um, but in recent years, its usefulness has um, appeared in the likes of uh, business, education and sport. So it's come to the fore in those three uh, domains. So basically, it, it, the reason why I use it is that it sits, it sits well with my coaching philosophy, which is really concerned with developing the, the whole person and focusing on um, players um, their health and their well-being. It's something I've been I've been practicing for a long time, um, both myself and but I've also been teaching it to athletes from other sports, um, students, clients, and our under 17 meters team for the last three years. So our, our aim basically is uh, to help them find. If you look at the um, the, the slide there and the quote inside, uh, George Mumford's quote inside it. 
uh, is to find that quiet center. It's to help them respond in a positive manner to the, the, the vagaries of life and sport. And this is where mindfulness comes, comes to the fore. So I use this slide um, when I'm teaching as part of um, a junior cert um, well-being program. It, it kind of explains mindfulness quite well. Like in today's uh, rush, we, we, we think too much, seek too much, want too much, and forget about the joy of just being. So as you, as you see in the, in the figure there, the, the person um, walking the dog, I don't see any leash though, but the person walking the dog, um, their minds, their mind, they, they have a cluttered mind. And I, I wonder, uh, like, is she enjoying the experience and is she noticing anything? Like, have you ever, I wonder, like I, I, I use this analogy a lot, like driving a car. I've often driven along a road and I could have passed on that same road hundreds of times. Uh, like, uh, for example, going from, I live in Greystones, going from Delgany down into Greystones. And I passed, I, I passed the school, passed, pa passed by the school recently and, and all of a sudden I saw a house in the distance that I'd never seen before and I'm living up here seven years. So like, to me, that's, that's been an automatic pilot. Um, in contrast, then you look at the dog and the dog is actually experiencing and witnessing the moment. You could say that the dog is mindful while the person's mind is literally full. So in our kind of switched up, switched on 24, seven culture we spend more time on autopilot reacting to like the arrays of internal and external stimuli and few of us ever live in the presence we're, we're we're forever anticipating what's to come or remembering what has gone we waste so much energy about thinking about the past what we can't do about it we, but we can't do anything about it all we can do is learn from it we spend we we they, they, we spend so much time focusing on the future, what I call the checkered flag, be it um, a final whistle or maybe your golf handicap if you play golf or your 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 wrong score in golf. But we forget the win, what I call the win, which is not winning the game, but what's important now: W full stop, I full stop, N full stop. So the key to, to mindfulness really is, is to suspend yourself or suspend your judgment and simply observe the thoughts as if you're suspending yourself above them and your emotions that, we're, that you're experiencing at the moment. Effectively, you're, you're, you're getting your mind and body in sync like you see in the diagram there. So we're not in, our bodies aren't in the past. Oh, sorry, our bodies are always in the present. Our minds are, aren't in the past, neither are they in the future. So our minds and our bodies are actually in sync. So it's it's not it's not about dwelling on the past, be it um, mistakes, missed shots, or dreaming of the future, like winning championships or games. But it's it's about concentrating the mind on the present moment. It's about being aware of what's happening as it's happening and focusing on the now. What's important now. So within, when I'm teaching mindfulness, I actually use the analogy of, of being up on a hill and looking down and watching the traffic go by. But I'm, I'm not paying, I'm not following those cars, I'm just letting them go. Um, if, you're, if, if you're into headspace, they'll talk about a blue sky and the clouds being um, the, clouds being the uh, thoughts that, that come into your minds and you just label them and let them go, label them and let them go. So if, let's, if we're looking at mindfulness from a sports context, in uh, the book on the left there, James Kerr's famous legacy book, he mentions the blue head and the red head terminology that the All Blacks have. They describe mindfulness as having a blue head, um, staying loose uh, in the moment, calm, focused, on the immediate task. And that contrasts then with, with a redhead, which is tight, anxious, unfocused, desperate, um, where we have a tendency to be reflexive 
as an R-E-F-L-E-X-I-V-E, as opposed to reflective. From a coach perspective, Joe Ehrman uh, in the book Inside Out Coaching uh, highlights uh, the development of mindset as the most profound journey a coach can take. He describes it as um, kind of a, the ability to perceive ourselves and others accurately. In other words, to being more aware of what's going on. In football, um, strangely enough, I, I was reading recently Car Carlo Ancelotti. He was an advocate of, um, of mindfulness with his uh, AC Milan team in the mid, uh, in the mid uh, 2000s. He, had, um, he, he actually had a mind room created. It was a glass room where his players could relax, de-stress and rejuvenate. And the players came, came to see it as their secret weapon. The last point I'd make would be the Seattle uh, Seahawks coach, um, Pete Carroll. He attributed their mindfulness to their uh, 2013 um, Super League win. It, his use of it was aligned uh, to his coaching philosophy of, of developing the whole person. So from, from a coaching perspective, we just outlined some of the benefits. It's been found to have a positive impact on coaching behavior. So it, it increases um, focus and our ability to attend to what's important now because we're focusing on what we're doing. It helps reduce um, stress in competition because we're equipped with the tools to cope. We've practiced, we've trained, we've, uh, we've, we've practiced our mindfulness. And so research has shown that um, uh, coaches who underwent mindfulness training, they described they had more positive interactions with their with their athletes or their players, and others outside of their sports environment. In other words, in their in their personal life. So, our, but if you look at it, our own um, stress as coaches or our emotional reactions, they have a kind of a mirrored effect on on our athletes. When we're stressed, it's quite they they pick up on it and they tend to be stressed, and that's reflected in, in most cases in their performance and on court. But mindfulness leads to kind of greater um, self-awareness of, of our behavior. So I see um, self-awareness as um, one of the most important elements of de developing coach expertise. If we're not self-aware and we don't take care of ourselves, how can we expect to take care of the, the people we coach? I'll give you another uh, analogy. I'm probably full of analogies tonight. But uh, when I'm teaching mindfulness, I um, I, I, I use this one. So imagine you went, remember when, or um, play back to when you would have got on a plane and just before the plane takes off, the flight attendant will come on with the safety message and they'll say, uh, in relation to the oxygen mask, when the oxygen mask is deployed, uh, pull on it and please um, look after yourself, take care of your own mask first before you can take care of anybody else's. So. That is, is a point in itself, in the sense that if you're not able to take care of yourself, if you're not if if if, if you're not able to take care of yourself, if you're not self-aware, how could you be expected to take care of, of a team to, to your best potential? So with self, with um, mindfulness, we um, we become more tolerant and, and balanced. Now I use um, I use uh, mindfulness. Um, I, sorry, I use um, a behavior analysis in 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 addition to mindfulness. So, um, I, what I would do is I would look at um, video of myself. I have permission to record my training sessions, and I would I would record my the audio, and then I would use um, what we call systematic observation in the trees. So, playback on how my behavior is. I would reflect on that, which is part of of um, increasing self-awareness. Um, I reflect on that and then see how, how I can improve um, by bringing more awareness to my, to my coaching. So mindfulness, um, it enables us to step back and engage with our players um, differently. And this leads to what we call improved, what I would call improved relationships. It also has greater, um, at least a greater work-life balance in the sense that we're more, we become more productive um, and we have a clearer mind. In relation to the benefits of um, the benefits to players, 
Um, they're similar to coaches. Um, these quotes were actually taken from those um, studies and more um, below. Um, improved concentration. Um, player quoted, I'm, I'm, I was 100% focused. Uh, I was only present in the moment and um, without thinking of the possible outcomes. So there, there's something we discuss, we'll discuss in a few minutes. I'll be giving you a couple of tools on um, where where to how to call how to train uh, your players and recognizing where their focus is placed um improve self-awareness the clear quoted i had i feel i have an improved awareness of, for for my inner experiences like such as nervousness anxiety whatever i feel i feel i'm calmer because of that so again self-awareness enhance performance um, I feel that the program has helped me perform better um, in my shooting. This was this wasn't basketball, obviously. Um, this was um, probably clay. I think clay pigeon shooting. Um, my results are better now. Uh, the improved ability of focusing has generally had a, a positive effect on my school performance. Now, I reference that with my under 17 team. Um, I had half of them do junior cert last year and half of them do junior cert the year before. And they actually reported back to me that they're actually using it. Um, they're they're actually used. They've used um, mindfulness, and it's actually helped them help their performance in their exams. Um, regarding improved recovery, um, just one study um, from um, a Norwegian study actually showed that um, players that that actually perform mindfulness they had a, a low had lower lactate levels and quicker recovery. Uh, the player um, quoted here, slept better, um, feel I, I wake up more recovered, and they attributed that to um, the fact that they actually went to bed not thinking as much, clearing their head. Other benefits include um, happiness, being more chill, less triggered, more balanced, um, and it also improves um, confidence. Where you're um, you're more confident that you uh, have the wherewithal to reach the, your goal. Now, specific to basketball, um, study there by uh, Good, Good, Gooding and Frank in 2009. They had 17 NCAA players from uh, three teams, and they performed um, a free throw study and or mindfulness study on them. And the results indicated that um, the levels of mindfulness had a significant bearing on their free throw percentage. And we all know how important that is in um, win or lose games. The coaches also uh, rated um, a 20% plus uh, improvement in player performance. Now I'm going to share you a link, hopefully it will work, of um, LeBron James and him using mindfulness. Bear with me. It's only eight seconds or ten seconds long. So we'll come back to that now. So Le LeBron James, okay, he, he's he, the star that he is. He's not afraid to practice mindfulness, but um, on on the side of the court. But isn't that a great example to use as a role model for teaching mindfulness, for getting your players to embrace it and to take it on board? Oops, what happened here. Bear with me. Ah, got it. Now, in the next clip, um, you see Phil Jackson. He speaks about um, mindfulness and how he used it with his teams. Hopefully, this will work. Next one. Ah, one more. Bear with me. I've lost it. <laughs> Oh, uh, no. One is okay, we got it.
this one. So we talked about mindfulness as being, you know, as much as we pump iron and we run to build our strength up, we need to build our mental strength up. We need to build our mental strength so we can focus, get one pointed attention, so that we can be in concert with one another in times of need. Mm -hmm. When you come off the court, you had a bad call, things going wrong for you, you sit on the bench, take a breath, and you reseat yourself, you reset yourself. And you do that through this mindfulness. You just come right back in and collect yourself. So we practiced mindfulness is what you have to do. So you would literally have the guy sit in stillness. That's right. Meditate. Talk to them out of, hold their hands where the shoulders had to be. The whole process of you know, being in an upright situation so that you're not slouched and you're not going to fall asleep. And... They bought into it. Would you do this before every game? You would do this regularly? You would do this? We we introduced it. We introduced it in training camp. And then the day of games, we started using it. And ultimately, it became a process where... It's like you, centering yourself. That's centering. right. Just getting back to being centered. Mm -hmm. Did you not? So, um, I'll just come out of this now. Back up here. So that was Phil Jackson, um, professional team, professional players, and facing it. So we come to almost there, what I'm using. So I, 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 with these 17s that I'm coaching and others that I'm currently working with, I kind of employ two types of activities, so both formal and informal. So at, with the formal ones, um, we can use them at the start, at the end, or um, out of the session, and it's either on a team or a one-to-one -one basis. So the ABCs obviously aren't the alphabet. Um, it's awareness of your breath and your surroundings, a body scan, and then you're focusing on your breath and you're counting them. You can see where... Um, the um, focus uh, could improve here. So I see it as a kind of an inverted triangle, somewhat somewhat like the inverted triangle there under the, what's I'm, what I'm using. Um, so you're, you're narrowing your focus um, using different angles. Um, we use this um, after uh, our yoga sessions at the end of our uh, training session. So we put time aside at the end of, towards the end of every training session. Uh, not at the end, but towards the end, um, so the session isn't officially finished. And we do our yoga session, and then we would actually use, do some mindfulness. Um, for concentration, I use what we term the, the mindfulness ladder, or um, I provided them with a, a, an audio on um, mindfulness on a, an object, be it a basketball or a water bottle or whatever. Um, when With stepping into fear, now that's a little bit deeper, um, it's on a one-to-one -one basis, and it's it's used to help um, players accept um, negative um, minds, negative mind, and a, a, their negative emotional states. And it develops a, kind of a different um, relationship to those um, experiences. So, like for example, fear of losing or performing badly in front of people. Um, you kind of what you're doing is your um, uh, what the word I'm trying to find is you're you're nullifying the the effect that it would possibly have on them. You're 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 making them a little bit more immune to it um, because they're having to face it in in um, the um, stepping into fear activities. Now with the with the informal um, uh, uh, or, yeah with the informal activities are done during um, the training session. And I'll take you through one of those now in the next slide. But reporting on all of those, the, the under-17s felt that um, they had a mental edge and that this was having, having that a mental edge was their X factor. Off the court, as I said earlier, they used uh, these tools in school, particularly in their exams. So it's great buying um, from them. And the parents, ob parents obviously loved it. So with the focus circle, I hope the screens aren't... Um, Oh, the text isn't too small. Um, God help you people that are, are watching this on phones. Um, the focal circle, it's a, an informal approach. I came across it actually in a study on a, 
Danish international uh, badminton team uh, from it was performed on them from 2014 to 2016 and it involves the use of two tools. The circle on the left um, is used to increase awareness and register name, categorize their thoughts and um, their focus. The, in using it, you're, you're checking in and you're identifying the type of focus you had. So if you refer back to the right there, on, you'll see the color, small colored circles. So the blue one is focusing on the task and the game plan in line with whatever mission or values we have you have now we we have five particular values in our team and we'll talk about them later in a few minutes that particular blue focus is non-judgmental now that's mindfulness you're not judging what you're doing um the yellow fo yellow focus if a player reports a yellow focus they're they've been focusing on distractions um orange um focuses you're focusing on your performance are you comparing um, your your performance um, or your expected performance. Um, you're comparing you're comparing between your expected performance and your actual performance, or maybe you're comparing to um, a teammate. And the red focus, you're focusing on results and consequences of those results. So afraid of winning a game, you're worried about winning a game. So therefore, you're not focusing on your task at hand. And on the grey focus. Uh, circle you're focusing on things outside of here and now uh, performance setting your family friends purpose illness or what I tell uh, players uh, you're, you're not here at all you're outside the door or you're at home having a coffee within those last four the yellow the orange the red and the gray you're judging your thoughts and your feelings and you're you're focusing on either the past or the future you're worried about either what happened in the past or Maybe at missing shots or whatever, um, being beaten on defense, and are you worried about the future? What's going to happen? What's the coach going to say to you? What are your teammates going to think of you? Um, so the second tool, then we incorporate with that. It's kind of a collaboration with the focus circle. Um, the first point it would be we kind of register and you register and you notice your thoughts and your feelings and your body sensations. You're identifying uh, what thoughts and feelings have shown up. For example. Um, be worried about losing to a teammate or um, you're distracted by let's say we play music sometimes in training you are distracted by the music or you're distracted by someone chatting or something going on in the background For, once you've registered those thoughts then you're you release yourself from those thoughts and feelings you you can use your breath as a trigger um, to get presence typical mindfulness or by labeling your thoughts and then um, you um, identify the type of focus as being either blue, orange, red, or gray. For example, um, the first um, example I gave there was uh, worried about losing to a teammate. That would be orange for worry. Uh, what's, that would be orange for worrying about them, uh, about, what, about losing to the teammate, or um, yellow for the um, distraction in uh, whatever activity you were, or game you were doing. The minute you start, and this is this is probably um, uh, key and, and, and uh, core to mindfulness. The minute you start labeling those thoughts, you're creating a distance from them. So you're like that person up on the, the hill looking down at the cars passing by. You've created a distance because you've actually you've um, labeled them. And the third point then we, we move to would be refocusing to the blue. You're always looking to go back to the blue, looking to go back to your game plan or your task at hand, um, being in line with whatever values. So just to give you an idea of our five values, um, we have five fingers on our hands and I use the Coach K analogy, so which is we close a fist, but our five fingers relate to um, teamwork. We can't do it alone. Um, loyalty, ring finger, we're loyal to each other. Um, we don't disrespect each other. And we're always looking to move forward and we're always encouraging each other. That's what we stand for as a team. And that's that's it in, um, in a nutshell. So teaching it, um, it's a layered approach we use. Um, I begin um, with uh, breathing exercises and I focus on the blue, the yellow and the gray circles. So I get them to breathe and focus on the breath and where it's where it's uh, going um, and then it's it will stop after about a minute and I'll say okay tell me 
where where did your folk where was your focus at that time? Was it blue, yellow, or um, was it uh, grey? Were you in a different place entirely? Were you wandering out out the door? Um, then we moved to like activities and games, which are probably not which would be non-sport. So we'd look at uh, maybe six one minutes, um, let's say competitive Sudoku games. Um, so and then we check in between each game and see, okay, what what thoughts were you? Did you notice? Um, what what lay, what color were they? And then let's try and refocus now back to the the blue. And then we we progress to a simple basketball activity, let's say um, a farm shooting competition, uh, looking to get swishes, um, score swishes out of let's say 20 left hand, right hand. Um, then we increase the difficulty, come up with some other activity, and then we provoke activities by let's say let, let them play a scrimmage and call a timeout. And if one team was let's say leading by let's say five two or something, we'd flip the score and see what they're and put it maybe put a time limit on it and see how they react um and then stop it and go through the the, the 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 focus circle again and then the last point um or the last activity or layer we would add would be um training um using training games against stronger opposition um just to see how they how they would react to it and um what their focus was like and um how the focus circle was working so, but, but the important thing I stress with all of this, it's like um, train. Uh, we practice basketball. Um, we we expect our players to train hard, but we for this to work, you have to it, you have to get them to actually practice mentally as well. They have to put the time into it. It takes time and it takes practice, and it ain't easy. It's not easy, um, but it does make a difference. So that's um, that's me in a, in a nutshell. Um, I'll hand you back there. Thanks, uh, Paul, for um, allowing me to participate. I hope it didn't bore anybody. Um, no, it was great. It beneficial. Yeah, it was great. And um, you know, we just had some questions, and there's nothing come in. But I guess I mean I've been asked in sports psychology as well, and I think the hardest thing to do is practice on yourself. So it's always nice to have somebody to to re-engage you on those thoughts. Um, I guess a um, couple of things that I kind of spotted and it really was, can you make a part of your practice? And what I mean by that is, is there are certain times where you might flip the switch on somebody, um, you know, act as a bad referee. Um, so I suppose essentially when you practice your mindfulness, is there a way of assessing, are they actually having that ritual ability of, as Phil Jackson said, reset, reset, and, and reset um, for, for players. Um, we use activities, um, as I was saying there earlier. We we would use um, I use changing the game card. So we would pick a card, and it could be flip the score. Um, but we would what we would do. We would stop um, the game at the like the players can call a timeout, or we would let the let the let the quarter run out if it's, we're running eight minutes on the clock. Um, and then we would check in with them and part of the checking in process is looking at that focus circle and seeing, okay, where was your focus right now? What were you focusing on? And um, with habit, um, if you do it enough, they actually stick to it. I, I, I was, we had an online session last night and with my team and I was surprised, um, but probably maybe not surprised with them. Uh, one of the players in the background actually had um, had a focus circle sticking on a notice board. So they were actually using it. But to answer right. your question, stop the game, uh, uh, put them into situations, stop the, stop the game and check in and see if, if that was the case. If that was the case. Like people think that mindfulness was, and I, 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 in the last few years I would have only come across this, that like mindfulness is, is formal activity. You're sitting down uh, at the start, at the end of training session and you're in a Zen mode, you're sitting, your eyes are closed, or you're lying, and whatever, um, and that's it. But it's not. It can be done um, during a session. It can be done uh, while they're playing. Um, you can pull a player off the court and ask, okay, what what focus were you or what were you in there? What color right. were you in? And keywords like the the, the the circles. I find the circles very very beneficial. Very good. Very good. Um, 
you mentioned the phrase during it um and it might affect i guess the question i'm asking is does it affect mindfulness is the fear of losing is that yeah. something that can affect somebody's psyche or their um outlier character i suppose in one respect well it's, it can be trade can't it it can be part of their personality if they're anxious if they're anxious people they're they're going to fear like they might fear failure um but um the stepping into fear uh, exercise um is actually beneficial now um one of probably one in msd in sports psychology to do it but it's actually quite beneficial or put them into situations in training that exposes them to that type of situation but do it gradually layer it and then then um you'll build up an they'll build up an immunity to it and don't put like i don't stress an enormous importance on um we don't stress winning we don't mention winning you've probably heard that from me before yeah but uh we so, don't we don't people think i'm cuckoo with it but i don't yeah so is it is the case for a coach is watching is the case of um is the case of focus on performance related goals as opposed to the outcome of the scoreboard yeah yeah it's a process and performance as opposed to outcome like we don't um we don't we, we don't look at at um scoreboards i had a player a couple of years ago looked up at the scoreboard and they hauled her off because her focus had gone off the game okay she was looking at the scoreboard she was worried about the end result she was worried about to check her flag uh, for any of you that play golf like typical issue with some golfers is that they're going on the first tee and they're worried about their handicap i call it the horrible age um or they're worried about what score they're going to get at the end of the 18 rounds that will affect their handicap okay so we need to focus on one shot at a time one possession at a time like all ireland final last year aicc is under 16 we focused on one possession at a time i was counting the possessions done all right defensive stops defensive stops excellent excellent um yeah, Mike, there's just a question out coming in there for Carl. So I might bring Carl back in if that's okay, Aaron. Mm -hmm. um, Carl, are you still there? Yeah, still there. There you go. There you go. Um, actually, don't worry, that's coming in. Um, by the way, Pop Summers wants to um, play for you next year because you give him, you get you give everybody the green light. So Pop said he's gonna, he wants to play for you next year. Um, <laughs> quick one. Uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> when young players come into a setup at super league level coming from an underage level how long does it take for them to adapt and be successful in the continuity of the offense um it's actually far easier to teach it to kids um, because they don't have if you if you can get them under 14 um Kind of, you know, under under 13, 14, 15, they don't have all the bad habits that the uh, that the, the senior players have. Um, it's far easier to to kind of um, ingrain those habits in them. And so, if you look at someone like again, I was talking about the same players around the whole time. Ella McCluskey just moves off the ball just incredibly well for, for someone that plays their position. But I was, again, Ella was on that team. Um, in 2014 she's been doing now every year for the last six years and um it's far easier for her to pick up when people come from from a different uh system or a different way of playing it's look it's it, it all depends on how on um, i suppose the players um basketball iq that you talked about earlier and how quickly they can pick things up but again if you <clears throat> what, what i try and do when even with america when we bring americans in uh, you, you do it one layer at a time. You tell them, look, focus on this, focus on what you do after you pass. Once we get that down, now we focus on, well, what am I doing on the weak side? How uh, Again, am I seeing the back of my defender's head? Is there is there strong foot? Can I see their heel? Uh, you know, uh, and, and kind of build it up like that. That's a common word that both of you have used tonight is, is layering. So obviously layering the mindfulness and layering the actual basketball performance. So we can see how both of these have, um, have kind of overlapped in one respect. Uh, we've back, we've, you know, we've, we've, we have um, we we have a kind of um, a fault at times of going from going from one extreme to, to the other and expecting the proper res the result the result that we aim for which is um, doesn't happen 
but by layering it, you're you're making it you're 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 imp you're improving the possibilities of success. Yeah, yeah. And going back to you, Aaron, just something that's coming from uh, Tiernan O'Donnell. Any tips for the fourth quarter refocusing players in big games? In any well, game, really, I guess, because every game is a big game. The first thing I'd say is practice it in training. We put okay, our team. We, we use a scoreboard. We use a score. That's the scoreboard from a sense of the clock. We count defensive stops, but we we use the scoreboard or the, the clock. We use the clock and we use the counting down. So we put them into situations where I would say um, three minutes. Actually, I, I'll give you a game. Um, Paul, uh, my assistant coach, gave to me. So set the set the score at let's say forty five all, and first team to fifty. But you're not running the clock yet. First team to 50, and once you get to 50, whoever gets to 50, the clock runs, and let's say set three minutes on the clock, and it's game on at that score. Now that's putting teams in different predicaments. Now we've taken a step forward, as I, as I mentioned a few times, and during that three minutes, I I could stop after a minute and flip the score. I could okay. flip the score around, and that's putting them into situations that hey, where. We're ready for we're like when, when they go when 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 they go into a fourth quarter game and they've experienced that. Like we played uh, AICC semi final last year and we were I think it's thirteen or fifteen down at one stage in the third quarter in a six or seven minute quarter, and we came back in and and won the game by a point because we had done it in training. Right, we had right. put ourselves through that in training. So yeah. you need to practice it. You need to practice. I know what would your view when Carol will be, or Carol. So, say that again, Aaron. What would you? What would your views be on that? On yeah. on putting. Sorry, you paused there for one second. I was changing the internet connection. Go again. I said, what would your view be on that? On on how, how would you how would you practice for four quarters? Um, how would I practice for the fourth quarter? Yeah, would you do any practice for the? Would you put them into game situations like? Yeah, well, I mean, what, what, what we try to do so so for shooting, if, if for shooting, for example, we talk about game situations. So again, we, we um, the team this year shot the ball very well from the three point line, but in training, all of our all of our trees are, are always contested, um, yeah. and we, we've got different drills where you try and make it as game like as you can, but at the same time, no matter how game like you try and make it in training. It's different when you're in a national cup final or when you're at the European Championships and the the place is going crazy with drums and you know there's family and friends there and everyone's watching and um you know how they how they deal with adversity um sometimes separates the um separates the the, the really good ones from everyone else because again I've seen you know the the most talented players not be, just not be able to show up on on the big stage because because they That's couldn't right. handle it. um so how you how you how you prepare for that? Uh, I haven't found the answer yet. <laughs> yeah, I go back to um, my lecturer in WIT was famous Jerry Fitz, and he would all he would say at 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 some stage in every session, particularly at the end, always finish with a game situation. Always put them into some form of testing game situation, and that will at least you're doing something as opposed to crossing your fingers and hoping that something's going to happen. Like I would have the same approach to you, Carol. In the sense that um, all of our shots are contested, we we would have defenders running at us at various stages, so they're all contested shots. Um, we don't shoot on this is form shooting. We don't shoot on air, or we don't shoot on contested. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so going back to Carl's, probably um, I'll, I'll double barrel this question, Carl, so that we can finish up with Aaron. Then um, two things. Going back to here on Dunn's um, session on Monday night, and hopefully people have been able to get that link on YouTube. Um, but he spoke about small sided games. Is that part of your practice in terms of your five out scenario? And then how do you attack mismatches? How do you attack mismatches? Yeah, hundred percent. And so again, with the um, with underage teams, especially when you're kind of taking them to start. If I want to introduce a new action, I'll generally do it off uh, a shooting drill, right? And so you'll 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 put in a shooting drill, and all of a sudden, then now now you put in that action, and eventually someone will go, "Oh, we just did that a minute ago," and and, and you try and try and build it in in that where 
uh, you build it up. Tommy O'Mahony does an, a, a, a brilliant job at this kind of thing where he'll build it up slowly and add in a defender and add in a second defender and add in a weak side and um, and do it like that. And I, I would do every, I particularly with um, ball screens, right? So you'll do a three on three and I'll put a lifter in the strong side corner or I'll put someone in the weak side corner and then you put, um, what I'll generally try and do is, um, uh, I, I used to think Brian O'Malley is where I saw, um, you, correct, you corrected me a couple of summers ago, where you know you hold a hand out and you, you do the advantage, disadvantage drill where the defender has to tap a hand and now yeah. offense is in the lane and, and you do those kind of drills so that then you can build up to five on five and now when that scenario happens, well, we know exactly what our options are and, and where the defenders are, are, um, are going to be. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah, and then that's how you attack your mismatches, kind of getting it. So, like, we use a phrase of, we use a phrase of who's hot and who's not. So, like, we go back to what you said a while ago in terms of your shot selection and, and what's a good shot. We say unbalanced, in rhythm, and uncontested. And then we go to who's hot and who's not. So, if I'm not really hot, but I, I'm in those three areas, you gotta find a way again to the person who's in, who's got the hot hand. So something like that. It's, 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 an, area, it's, it's an area that I find. Uh, so we do, we we do a video section every week um, at Super League, and it's an area that I find re- that in particular f- identifying our mismatches because sometimes they don't. It, it's hard to see in the live flow of a game, and sometimes yeah, maybe at a time out you'll say, look, you missed. X person rolling inside and like, no, I didn't. They weren't open. And then we go back to the video and they go, oh, actually, they were open. So now, now we know that. You know what? If we set this back pick back, if if I have a shooter uh, back picking the way out and they back pick our forward and they switch that, well, two things are going to happen now, right? My forward's going to have a, a little guard on them rolling in the lane with no help, or I'm now whoever set the screen is going to pop and I'm now looking to hit a shooter who now has a, 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 a forward on them and we kind of talk about, well, now we look to attack. And if it's a guard with a forward on the perimeter where we're putting the ball on the floor and what we do, now we all know where we're moving. Um, right. But again, identifying, the, that's what, what I kind of talk about with, with the kids, teaching them how to identify where your advantage is. So if you can identify, we have a mismatch here, I want to attack that, how am I going to attack it? Um, Video is really helpful doing that. Very good. And on Thursday night, we also have a video session with Kieran Toner, who is the Dublin GEA and also was part of a couple of Irish smash teams. So our curriculum this week is kind of going to fill all those roles a little bit. So I'm kind of excited for that one on Thursday night too. I think we finish up with you, Aaron, now on these last two questions. Um, one, I'm going to give you a double barrel question again so you can answer them both. Are parents supportive of mindfulness in, in what you're doing? And two, um, how does all this mindfulness tie in with short, medium, and long-term goal setting? Um, parent supportive, yeah, yeah. They, they're anything that's anything that's going to improve their their um, kids' well-being, mental health, and well-being, and even their exam results is definitely um, definitely um, a positive from a parent's perspective. Um, in relation to the goal setting, um, no, I don't see any any um, conflict with short, medium, or long-term goals. Um, we set our goals at the start of every year, and our, our goals are um, they're process-driven. Uh, I'd have should have would have loved to have actually shown you. We actually have a chart that we use. Um, where we actually post that chart up every a post, or we post that post it up every stick it up every night at training sessions, and it ident- it, it reminds them of their goals, but they're they're process driven. Um, we look at the results at the end of the year. We we evaluate them during the year, um, but they're the same goals. Um, they're just broken down into little chunks, and mindfulness is making any difference, make no difference. It actually improves it if anything, because you're getting you're you're not cluttered. They're not a cluttered mind. What they're doing, if, if they're doing something, the aim is to do it in the blue focus. Um, you certainly don't want them in the grey. Because in the grey, they might as well be at home. But uh, and you will, you will, they will get distracted. You will, they will get distracted. The mind isn't going to be, isn't going to stay, remain focused for the whole game. Yeah. You've got to switch on and switch off. What they say about playing golf is that you're not going to play golf. Your, your mind, you're not focusing for 24 hours. Let's for, say, for example, when you're playing golf. You're only focusing on 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 your shot at a time, one shot at a time. 
So maybe one possession at a time, 24 seconds, you know. Excellent. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much. You've been superb, just like our previous speakers. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much to the basketball community. Hope you're getting a couple of things out of our last three uh, speakers and especially tonight again. Um, looking forward to tomorrow night. We've got two very, very experienced and talented players and coaches in their position. So we'll have the infamous Puff Summers talking about being a point guard and we'll have the Hall of Famer, Suzanne McGuire, talk about being a post player. And we've already started the banter of which is the dominant position. So I'm looking forward to the conflict resolution I'm going to have to deal with tomorrow night between those two guys. So um, thank you very much. Follow Thanks, our uh, HSC, as we've always said every night so far. Do what was the last of us, stay home. And this is a great opportunity to stay home and, and learn as best we possibly can. Um, and keep reaching out to us. And if, as I said, if there's anything you'd like us to talk about over the next couple of nights, even though we have the topic set, feel free to let me know and uh, we go from there. Tomorrow, 2 p.m., we'll be releasing the links. We're going to give two days between each speaker to let people who have been attending to digest before everybody else. And it'll be up in the huddle link. So tomorrow, last night's sessions will be on huddle tomorrow, including the resources and stuff like that. Um, and we go from there. Um, so thank you very much, guys. Enjoy thank your you. evening. Stay safe and be healthy. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Thank you.